It's a lovely morning for a change. And I hope you had the pleasure of looking at the long shadows of the morning. We've had many, many questions, and we didn't count them. But must, there must have been over a hundred. And out of those, we have chosen some. Not because they are easy to answer, or what we like to answer, but we have chosen some that may be representative of some of the questions that have been put. There have been rather, if I may point out, rather absurd questions, but there are these questions which we have gathered together and put it this morning. When one asks a question, is the answer more important than the question itself? When one looks to an answer, one overlooks the question. In the question itself, if we examine it deeply, is the answer. In the question itself. And how one approaches the question is all important. Not try to find a clever or not clever or an answer that is worthwhile or personal. So, please bear in mind that we are together, and I must emphasize again, together, that we are examining the question. And out of that question, in the investigation of that question, the answer is inevitable. There are ten of them this morning. I don't know if we can answer all of them, but we'll try. What do you mean by insight? Does it differ from intuition? What do you mean by insight? Does it differ from intuition? What do we mean by intuition? Having a hunch that having a feeling that's the right thing. And intuition also having been sensitive capturing something which may be conditioned, which may be personal, which may be a desire, wish, fulfilment. And we must be clear and hesitant in using that word intuition. Because it may be one's own unconscious desire, one's own a longing for something to happen, or sudden feeling that is the right thing to do. But I think insight is different. May we go into it together. The scientists the physicists, the 
technological people have an insight into some invention. They see something new. Is that insight partial, or is an insight whole? You understand? We are meeting, I hope, together. I may have an insight, as I am an engineer, into the structure of a brick. And I operate according to that insight. That insight is being more powerful. I adjust all my knowledge to conform or adjust to that knowledge, right? to that insight. But is that insight partial? A poet, a painter, a musician may have an insight. But it is still partial. When we use the word insight, we mean insight into the whole movement of life, not one part of it. Right? So let us together find out what we mean by insight. How does it take place? If you are interested in it. Because that may be the solution for our problems, especially psychological issues that, we, that, we, that are such tremendous travail in all our lives. So together, Let's find out what we mean by insight. Is I'm questioning it, so please question it also. Is insight an action of memory? Uh, one has accumulated a great deal of knowledge, psychologically or physically, and that knowledge may, being limited, see something very clearly. But that knowledge being always in the field of ignorance, because there is no complete knowledge about anything, including oneself, And when there is an insight part from that limited knowledge, that insight must also be limited. So insight we mean by that word, it is not the outcome of knowledge. Knowledge being, you can examine, say, for example, all the comparative religions, the various sects, the various uh, rituals, and so on. You can examine them, study them, and come to a conclusion. Whereas that conclusion may be rational, sane, logical, but it is based on the activity of thought, and therefore it is limited. And that conclusion naturally must be limited. That is clear. Whereas if your insight has nothing whatever to do with knowledge, it has nothing to do 
with remembrance. But you have an insight saying to all the comparative religions, with all their rituals, um, sanctions, dogmas, beliefs and so on, if you have an insight into all that, you see they are all similar. Right? They are all based on thought. And therefore, all religions are limited. There is an immediate perception of it, not logical conclusion and action, but the total perception of all the religious activities in the world, having an insight implies you see that they are essentially limited because they are put together, invented by thought. Similarly, to have an insight into one's relationship, which is much more difficult. Relationship, as it is now, based on images, hopes, pleasures, fears, and so on, essentially based on the images that thought during a period of time, maybe a day or ten years, has built it. To have an insight into that, that is, relationship is based on images, to have an insight into that, is to dispel the images. I hope you are following some of this. <laughs> Suppose I am married or have a girlfriend. My relationship actually is based on my particular like and dislike, my particular attraction, sexual or otherwise, the environmental influences, the biological demands, and I establish a relationship with, with another person based on that, obviously. And is it possible to have an insight into the whole movement of relationship, not come to a conclusion that I have images, I must break them, how to break them, and so on, so on, so on, but to have an insight into it, which means to see basically what it is, fundamentally what it is. And if one has that deep insight, the action which comes out of, the, out of that insight is much more logical, much more sane, and has a quality of something original, love. I hope you are following all this, right? That is, To take a very simple example, all nationalism is glorified tribalism. Right? All nationalities, all national, whether it's American, Russian, or the rest of it, is tri glorified tribalism. Right? moment you have an, see that, that is a very limited, narrow feeling which divides man to have, an, to have an insight into that is to be free from all the tribalism. 
right? I, I, are you following all this? Or, if you have an insight into the question of obedience, and following, whether it's the obedience to a guru, to a priest, to a law, and so on, to have a deep insight into this quality of following and obedience, Will you obey, follow anybody? Naturally, you will obey, you will obey laws, whether they're good or bad. That's we're not discussing how far you can go, how far you cannot. Go. That's not a problem for the moment. But the whole concept of following and obey, obey. Obey a doctor, I obey a surgeon, and if I'm not too neurotic and the policeman isn't too brutal, I obey. But the whole psychological desire in which lies the security of following. If I follow somebody, I feel safe. Whether it is a psychiatrist or a priest or my wife or husband, whatever it is, I've, one feels safe. Right? Now, if you have an insight into that, that is, this a mind, a brain that is conditioned to follow, that the feeling of following and the urge to follow completely drops away, instantly. So insight has, is not brought about through will, through desire, through memory. It is immediate perception, and therefore action. Have I... When we talk about perception, is it possible to observe without the word? Please try, do it as we are talking, and we'll see. <coughs> Is it possible to observe a tree, a person, the speaker, to observe without the word? The word <coughs> indicating all the memories, the reputation, the remembrances, without the word implying all that, knowing the word is not the thing, can you observe without the word? Right? And when you observe, is the observer different from the observed? Goes like uh, one observes that tree. There, the observer, I hope, is different from the tree. Right? The observer is not the tree. It would be rather neurotic say, I am the tree. But to observe the tree without the calling it the tree, without the name, 
the name and all the things associated with that name is the tradition, the memory, the past, which says that is the tree. To look at it without all that in operation. Right? Please do it as we are talking about it. And can one observe oneself without the word, without all the associations connected with that word, to look at it. And when you do observe in such manner, is the observer different from the observed? Wait, I'll show it to you. I am. The feeling of anger arises in me. Is that anger different from me? Or I am anger. But what thought has done is, a moment later, one says, I have been angry, which means I, have, I am separate from that anger. Are you following all this? Whereas the actual fact is, when there is anger, there is only anger, that feeling. There is no observer different from the observed. That division arises only after. Out of that division comes all our conflict. Right? So is it possible to observe without the world? without all the memories associated with that word. Then only the observer is the observed, and eliminates altogether the division which brings about conflict. To have an insight into that is to end the division. Right? How can the idea, you are the world, and you are totally responsible for the whole of mankind, be justified on a rational, objective, sane basis? How can the idea of you are the world, and you are totally responsible for the whole world, in quotes, be justified on a rational, objective, sane basis. I'm not sure. When he's not sure, it can be rationalized on a safe, objective basis. But we'll examine it first before we say, is it first of all? The earth on which we live is our earth, right? It's not British earth, the French earth, or the German, Russian, Indian, Chinese. It's our earth on which we are all living. That's a fact. But thought has divided racially, geographically, culturally, economically. 
that division is causing havoc in the world, obviously. There is no denial of that. That is rational, objective, same. Right? And we've, we have been saying, human beings living on this earth, which is our earth, all ours, not the isolated, divided communities, our earth on which we are all living, though politically, economically we have divided it, for security, for various forms of patriotic, illusory, and which eventually brings about war. That's we have also said that human consciousness – please go into this with me, we may disagree, you may say it is all nonsense, but please listen to it and see if it is not rational, objective, <laughs> say. All our human consciousness is similar. Right? We all, wherever, on whatever part of the earth we live, we all go through great deal of suffering, great deal of pain, great anxiety, uncertainty, fear, and we have occasionally, or perhaps often, pleasure. This is the common ground on which all human beings stand. Right? This is an irrefutable fact. We may try to dodge it, we may try to say it is not, I am an individual, and so on, so on. But when you look at it objectively, non personally, non as, as a British, French, and so on, you will, in examination, you will find that our consciousness is like the consciousness of all human beings psychologically. You may be tall, you may be fair, you may have long hair, maybe I may be black, white, pink, or whatever it is, but inwardly, psychologically. We are all having a terrible time. We all have a great sense of desperate loneliness. You may have children, husband, all the rest of it, but when you when you are alone you feel this feeling that you have no relationship with anything totally isolated. I'm sure most of us have, have had that feeling. And we are saying, this is the common ground of which all humanity stands. And whatever happens in the field of this consciousness, right, we are responsible. That is, if I am violent, I am adding violence to that consciousness, which is common to all of us. If I am not violent, I am not adding to it. I am bringing a totally new factor to that consciousness. Right? So, I am profoundly responsible either to contribute to that violence, to that confusion, to that terrible division, or, as I recognise deeply in my heart, in my blood, in my depth of my being, that I am the rest of the world, I am mankind, I am the world, the world is not separate from me then I become 
totally responsible, obviously. Which is rational, objective, sane. The other is insanity. To call oneself a Hindu, a Buddhist, a Christian, and all the rest of it. They are just labels. So, when one has that feeling, that reality, the truth of it, that every human being living on this earth is responsible not only for himself, but responsible for everything that is happening. Now, how will one translate that in daily life? Right? How will you translate it? If you have that feeling, not intellectual conclusion, as an ideal and so on, then it has no reality. But if the truth is that you are standing on the ground which is common to all mankind, and you feel totally responsible, then what is your action towards society, towards the world in which you are actually living? The world, as it is now, is full of violence, right? And only a very, very, very few people escape from it, because they are carefully guarded, protected, and all the rest of it. One realises, suppose, I realise I am totally responsible What's my action then? Shall I join a group of terrorists? Obviously not. Obviously, competitiveness between nations is destroying the world. The most powerful, the less powerful, and the less powerful trying to become more powerful which is competition, not only nationally, which is destroying the world, shall I, realising that I am the rest of man mankind and I am totally responsible, shall I be competitive? Please answer these questions. When I feel responsible for this, Naturally, I, will, I, I cease to be competitive. And also, the world, religious world, as well as the economic world, social world, is based on a hierarchical principle. Right? And shall I also have this concept of hierarchical outlook. Right? Obviously not, because that again is the one who says, I know, the other says, I do not know. The one who says, I know, is now taking a superior position economically, socially, religiously, and uh, has a status. And if, if you want that status, go after it, but you are contributing to the, great, to the confusion of the world. So there are actual objective Sane action, when you perceive, when you realise, when in your heart of hearts, in your depth of your being, that you are the rest of mankind, and that we are all standing on the same ground, (coughs) 
You use the word, you use the term psychological type. This is difficult to comprehend. Why do you say that psychological time is the source of conflict and sorrow? You use the term psychological time. This is difficult to comprehend. Why do you say that psychological time is the source of conflict and sorrow? Let us consider together what is time. Time by the watch, time by the sun setting, sun rising, time as yesterday, today, tomorrow, that tomorrow may be hundred years, and yesterday may be another hundred years backward, and the time today is that we are sitting here listening. That's time, physically, in the acquisition of knowledge, in so-called evolution. To learn a language, time is necessary. To become a physicist, time is necessary. Drive a car, time is necessary. Right? That's obvious. Is it that we carry this idea of time, which we have established naturally, logically, because I need time to learn a technique, is it that we have carried over this principle of time into the psychological world. You are meeting my point? You understand? Are we meeting each other? Or am I talking to myself? Right. <coughs> I'm asking the, que <coughs> the question. One realizes time is necessary in acquiring a skill. Is it that principle we have carried over into the psychological area? Or psychologically, time exists for itself. Not that we have carried it over, but time as a process of, e of evolution psychologically, Time in itself exists. You, you follow this? Please let's be quite clear on this point. Is there psychologically in itself intrinsic in itself, time. Or we have carried over from the time element that's necessary in learning a skill to the psychological world. So that there are the two problems. You that is, psychologically, does time exist per se, or we have introduced it? Because we have been conditioned to that, therefore we react to the psychological world in the same manner. Clear? So, it is obvious that we need term, time to learn a skill. Clear. Now we are asking, is time inherent in the psychological structure? 
psychological nature or thought has brought the element of time into it. You know, are we following each other? Is it too difficult? No. Huh? Right? May I go on? Richard, let's go slowly into it. I hope you are also working, not just listening. And we are coming, we are coming to that, sir. One moment. We'll come to that, sir, please. It's all right, sir. Take time. <laughs> Have patience. Patience has no time. Impatience has time. Right? When you're patient, you're silent, more listening. But if you're impatient, say, let's get on with it, time element comes in. Of course, obviously. So please, let's look at this sensitively, not say, you're right, I'm wrong, and so on, but sensitively, let's approach this question. Has, has thought introduced into the psychological realm the whole idea of time? Or, in the very nature of the psyche, time is? First of all, psychologically, thought, which is part of the psyche, thought has introduced time. I am this, I will be that. I am angry, I will get over it. I am not successful, but I will be. All that movement is time. The distance covered from what I am to what I shall be. The space between me, as I am, and as I will be. So time is what is the space to be covered to achieve that. So the, the whole process of that is time. I do not know myself. I must learn about myself, educate myself. The same thing is operating as in the world of skill. I'm going to learn about myself, which admits time. Right? So I'm ask, we are asking, time is a factor of thought. Thought is the response of experience, knowledge, memory, stored up in the brain. And that memory response, which is thought, this is again, this is an obvious fact. If you had no experience, no knowledge, you would be in a state of amnesia, or whatever you like to call it. But because we have accumulated a great deal of knowledge, psychologically, and that is stored up in the brain as memory and thought. So this whole process of accumulating knowledge about oneself, learning about oneself and gradually building information about oneself, 
all that implies time. That is psychological time and time by the day and by the watch. Chronological time and psychological time. Again, that is a fact. Now, apart from that, is the psyche inherent in the psyche this element of time, that is, being and becoming. Right? I'm only putting it in different ways. Is there inherent in me, which is the psyche, this question of time at all? Please don't jump to a conclusion. That is, in me there is a timeless state. I'm not saying that at all. That's the old tradition. We are not saying that. We're just asking, is the me free of time? Right? Obviously not. The me my family, my nation, my character, my capacity, my loneliness, my despair, my whole travailing existence is me. The me that's going to die, the me that lives, going to the office, laboratory, factory, whatever you are doing. And all that is the activity of thought, including the me. The me is my form, my name, the image I have about myself, if I have one, the, uh, the things I have done, the things I want to do, etc., etc. All that is me, which is my consciousness. That the content of that consciousness is put there by thought, which is time. Right? So there is psychological time, which is the movement of thought, fear, pleasure, pain, suffering, joy, so-called love, all that is the movement of thought. Thought being memory, space, time, the achievement of it. Now we are saying, please bear with me, We are saying that the psychological time is the factor of conflict and sorrow. That's the question I say. Why do you say that? As we've been pointing out during the talks, that thought is the root of fear. Thought is the root of pleasure. I have had pleasure yesterday, remembrance, and the desire to continue tomorrow. That is the movement of thought. And sorrow. Sorrow, as we say, is the essence of isolation. Sorrow is the outcome of of self-centred, egotistic activity. We are only putting it differently. So thought is responsible for this. 
and thought creates is time itself. Of course. So is it possible to have to be free of psychological time? Because that divides. And where there is division, there must be conflict, like the Jew and the Arab, like the capitalist and the totalitarian division between me and another, with my wife and the husband, and so on, so on. Wherever there is division, there must be conflict. That is law. It's not my law, it's, it's there. So, thought, time, space, psychologically, is the source of conflict and sorrow. After examining it, is it possible for thought, please listen to me, for thought to realize its own place, which is in the world of technique, and has no place psychologically. Please don't reject it, just look at it. Psychologically, time exists when I have an image about myself, and you tread on that image. That brings womb, that hurts. That is the element of time. Now, when, if I have no image about myself, you can. Uh, it's finished. Is that possible? Living in this world, married, and all the rest of it. That is, please. That is to have psychologically no tomorrow. It is not when Dante talks about all those who enter inferno and leave no hope. It is not that at all. You know what I am saying? Why do I have hope? Just not, I'm not saying you shouldn't or should. Why do we have hope? See what happens. I have a hope to be a great man, whatever it is, my hope. And I'm working for that. And I may fail. It generally does. Then I get bitter. Angry, violent, cynical. And violent, cynical, bitter, I'm adding to the confusion of the total consciousness to that. I'm maintaining that. Right? So if I have an insight into this, the image disappears entirely. You might ask the speaker, are you glibly talking about it? And have your own private, secret image? <laughs> I know you are terribly interested in that. <laughs> This question has been asked, I don't know how often, in India, in Europe, in America. And each time that question is asked, I'm very aware, not easily answered, which is, when I say there is no image about myself, either you say that's nonsense, or you say, it doesn't matter to me, as long as I have image about myself, right? 
You understand? It doesn't matter if you have no image about yourself. Who cares? But what is important is to find out how to, to live, not how, to find out if it is possible to live in this terrible world, dangerous world, criminal world, to have no image. Find out. Don't say it is not possible, or say it is possible, then you are... But to study the image that you have, and have an insight into it, and end it immediately. We have only answered three questions in an hour. Oh Lord, how does one draw the dividing line between knowledge which must be retained and which is ab and which is to be abandoned? What is it that makes the decision? I'll read it again carefully. How does one draw the dividing line between knowledge? which must be retained, and that which must be abandoned. What is it that makes this decision? Is that you understood the question? The same I explain it. May I remove it? The questioner is asking, where does knowledge, which is necessary to be a skillful engineer, carpenter, plumber, or if you want to be politician, I hope none of us do, And the line between that and the recording, please listen, the recording of personal knowledge, personal hurts, personal ambitions, where apparently we have sustained knowledge, and therefore harmful. So where do you draw the line between that and this? Is it clear? I mean, is it clear? And the questioner says, and what is it that makes this decision to keep that there and to not to keep it here? <coughs> Do you see one of the factors in this question? How we are all depend on decisions. I will decide to go there, I won't go there. Decide. What is the decision based on? Just look at it carefully, please. <coughs> my own, my past knowledge, past pleasure, past pain, past remembrance of things, which says, don't do that anymore, or do it. That is, in decision, there is a the element of will, right? Will is the, the accumulated, concentrated form of desire, right? 
Desire who says, I must do that, but I call it will. So, will is the accumulated concentration of desire. We have been into the question of desire. I don't want to go into it now because. Shall I go into it? Huh? No, thank God. Come on. I don't know why you are sitting here, there, sir, but we are talking about decision. We are saying there is a great element in decision, will. And that's on that base tradition, we are conditioned. I am questioning, the speaker is questioning the ac- that action at all. You understand? Because the will is a div- divisive factor, a dividing factor. I will do this, and my wife says, I will not do that. Right? So will is essentially desire and has in it the element of division, me and not me, and so on. I must succeed and so on. So is there a way of living, please listen to me, without the operation of will at all? Right? a way of living in which there is no conflict, and the conflict exists as long as I exercise will, obviously. I wonder if you are clear? Now, let's find out if that's possible. The question asks, how how does one draw the line between the accumulating factor of knowledge necessary to act skillfully and the non-recording factor of the psyche? Not recording my hurts, my insults, the flattery, the, all the bullying and all that. Not recording any of that. How does one draw the line between the two? Right? You don't draw the line. Moment you have drawn the line, you have separated. And therefore you are going to cause conflict between the knowledge and non-recording. Then you ask, how am I not to record? I am insulted, I be personally, the speaker has been insulted by professionals. So please don't join the professionals. How not to record the insult or the flattery? The same thing. The two are the same, two sides of the same coin. You understand? Flattery and insult. You insult me. My brain instantly records it. I get hurt. In the field of technology, I must record. But here, why should I record? You insult me, all right? Why, why should that insult be carried over day after day when I meet you and I see you have insulted me? And from that insult I retaliate. 
Now, what, is it possible not to record at all any psychological factors? You understand? You understand my question? My wife, if I have one, thank God I haven't got any, if I have one, she says something brutal after I've come back from the office, because she's had a tiresome day herself, with rambunctious children. Hmm? So she says something violently. Instantly, because I'm tired, I want some kind of peace in the house, so I record it. Now, I'm asking myself, I'm tired, I've wo- worked, I come into the house, she says something brutal, and is it possible not to record that incident at all? Otherwise, I am building an image about her, and she is building an image about me. So the images have relationship, not us. It's a very complicated, obvious fact. So, is it possible not to record? The recording process is to strengthen, give vitality to a centre which is the me. Right? Obviously. So is it possible not to do it? And it is only possible, however one is tired, to be attentive at that moment. When the wife or I am brutal. Because as we explained the other day with regard to meditation, where there is attention there is no recording. It's only when you are self centered and con and that very self centeredness is concentration, then there is record. So, to see the truth of this, you need knowledge in this level, and here you don't need knowledge at all. See how, sir, see the truth of it, what, what freedom it brings you. That's real freedom. Right? If you have any insight into it, you don't draw the line, nor decide. There is no record. Do we go on? Do you want? Basta or no? Intellectually, we understand that the observer is the observed. But what is necessary to perceive this so that what is necessary to perceive this so that it goes beyond the intellectual level? Intellectually, we understand that the observer is the observed. But this is but what is necessary to perceive this so that it goes beyond the intellectual level. The question is, what is necessary to go beyond this intellectual acceptance that the observer is the observed? Right? First of all, do, do we even intellectually accept it? Ah, question yourself, please. Do you even intellectually, that is, verbally, logically, discerning, 
and saying, yes, it is so logically, because it has been pointed out objectively, logically. And you say, yes. Is that so? Do you even intellectually accept that? Or it's just a lot of words floating around? But if you do accept it intellectually, what does that acceptance mean? When you say, when you say, I intellectually agree with you, what does that mean? It means absolutely nothing. It's just a form of conven convenient social acceptance, saying, yes, you're quite right, but you may be wrong. So, intellectually, we don't even accept it. <coughs> if we do, it is very, again, very superficial, <coughs> and therefore no value. But the fact is that the observer is the observed. That is the truth. That is, I am lonely. with all the implications I am lonely with all its implications <coughs> of tremendous feeling of isolation having no relationship with anything. I'm completely absorbed with fear in the sense of detachment from everything. That depresses me tremendously. And My natural instinct is to run away from it, suppress it, run off to some kind of meeting people, football, religion, all that. But the escape from the fact brings about the division. I am lonely, I must not be lonely, right? The escape from what is gives me not only conflict, because it is divisive, it helps me not to understand this thing called loneliness, right? Is loneliness separate from me? When I say, I'm, God, I'm lonely, is that feeling of desperate, anxious fear of loneliness, is that something separate from me? Or I am that? Right? You understand? I, my self-centred activity, my ambition, my image about myself and so on, all that has brought about this sense of isolation, which I call lonely, loneliness. That loneliness is not separate from me. If it is separate from me, I can act about it, run away, right? Suppress it, and so on. But if it is me, please understand, if it is me that is in the state of loneliness, what, what, what is one to do? <coughs> you understand my question? I am lonely. You know all the, the feeling of it. You may be married, have children, and so on. 
but you are basically terribly lonely. If that loneliness is something separate from me, then I'm in conflict with that loneliness. Right? I fight it, I try to fill it by knowledge, by excitement, by this or that. <coughs> but if it is me, I can't do anything about it. You understand? See, just stop there for a minute. Before I'm accustomed to do something about it. Now I realize I am that. Because I cannot do anything about it, it ends conflict, right? But the thing remains, right? In, I can't do anything about it, so it's there. So can I, please listen to this, can I remain, can my thought remain with it completely, <coughs> not run away from it, remain with that loneliness, with all its anxiety, fear, all the complexity of that loneliness, totally without any movement, look at it. When you look at it, if you look at it as an observer looking in, then again the problem arises. But the fact is that loneliness is you, so you have to look at it without the observer as a whole. When you do that, completely loneliness disappears totally, never to come back. Right, sir, I've answered five questions, that's enough.